In this video, we're going to discuss the periodic table of elements and periodicity. As we look at the periodic table, we'll want to look at what information is included in a cell of the periodic table. The number at the top, often in the darkest font, it's going to be the smaller number without decimal places, is the atomic number. The atomic number is the number of protons in the element. And this uh, second number here that will have decimal places, and it's often here at the bottom underneath the name of the element, is relative atomic mass or average atomic mass. And this is the um, number of protons plus neutrons, but this is for a mixture of isotopes. And as we discussed in the atomic structure video, an isotope is an atom of an element that has different numbers of neutrons. For boron, the majority of boron atoms would be boron 11, so they would have five protons and then six neutrons. And then there would be a population of approximately 20% that would be boron 10, so they would have five protons and five neutrons. When you average the atomic mass of this population that's about 20% boron 10 and about 80% boron 11, what you end up with is a average atomic mass or relative atomic mass that is 10.81. As we look at our periodic table, we'll have also the atomic symbol and the name of the element. So the atomic symbol, as you look at the periodic table, is always one capital followed by one lowercase. Now, on our periodic table, we can look at it two ways. We can look at it as a table of elements where each element is listed according to the number of protons that it has and generally according to increasing atomic mass. Or we can look at it as a table that states where all the electrons should be placed in an atom. The rows, or what we call period, so there's a term that you'll need to know that a period equals a row on the periodic table. So as you go across a period, each period is going to represent a shell of electrons on an atom. So we could say that if we had the element lithium, and we looked at lithium. Lithium has one, two, three electrons um, total. And so in the first shell, we would have two electrons. And then in the second shell, we would have a third electron. Now, this exactly corresponds to the total number of electrons in the atom. So each period represents a shell on an atom. The lower the period is on the periodic table, the more outer that shell of electrons is. And we have this very special term for the outer shell of electrons. And these outer shell of electrons is the only part of the atom that can interact with the atoms next door to it. Because that is some of the atomic theory that we use to explain reactivity, we say that those electrons are very special and they have a special name. The outer shell of electrons, and I'm going going to use this little e minus as a term for electrons, the outer shell of electrons is called valence electrons, okay? And the valence electrons are the ones that determine reactivity. However, valence electrons are only the, what we call the S electrons 
and the P electrons on the periodic table. So these central electrons do not count. So these are not valence electrons. So it's very easy to determine how many valence electrons are in an atom because we'll simply count across. That means that if we want to determine how many valence electrons are in an atom of an element, all we simply have to do is count the number of boxes on that row that are squared in yellow. So let's say that we want to know the number of valence electrons that lithium has. Lithium is right here on our periodic table. There's only one uh, square that has an electron in it on this row. And so electron has, uh, so lithium has one valence electron. Likewise, if we came back and looked at phosphorus, phosphorus is on the third period or row of the periodic table. And if we count across one, two, three, four, five, phosphorus then has five valence electrons. We simply skipped all of the squares that were in the central part. So even if we look at arsenic and we wanna know how many valence electrons arsenic has, Again, we're gonna to go to the row that arsenic's on, count across, one, two, three, four, five, and arsenic also has five valence electrons. Now, you notice that when we did phosphorus and arsenic, they're both in the same column or group of the periodic table. So you can see right here that on this periodic table, it's saying that um, it has the term group right there because the term group equals column. Um, you can also use the term family, uh, but group is usually the term that is used. And so all of the elements that are in the same group of a periodic table have the same number of valence electrons. So phosphorus and arsenic, they're in this group 15 or 5A, depending on how the periodic table that you are given is labeled. You'll also notice that the number at the top of the column is related to the number of valence electrons that that group has. So here, uh, this is group 15. Group 15 has five valence electrons. Or the other uh, labeling system that's commonly used on a periodic table is that it's group 5A. And so the Roman numeral in front of the letter A will also tell you how many valence electrons an atom in that group has. Since all of the atoms in the same group have the same number of valence electrons. Their reactivity then is similar. So if you're asked a question such as, what elements would you predict to have a similar reactivity to phosphorus? The answer to a question similar to that would be either nitrogen or arsenic because they're the two closest elements to nitrogen in the same group on the periodic table. Now that we understand what valence electrons are, we can look at how to determine what charges elements make based on their positions on the periodic table. Elements in group one have one valence electron. Elements in group two have two valence electrons. In group 13 have three valence electrons. Group 14 have four valence electrons. Group 15 have five valence electrons. 16 have six valence electrons. 17 have seven valence electrons. And group 18 have eight valence electrons. Atoms will tend to react such that they form the lowest energy state that they can. And the lowest energy state that they can is the same as having a full valence shell. 
In order to form a full valence shell, atoms will form ions. That means that they will either add electrons or subtract electrons based on how many electrons they have or how many valence electrons they have, not just how many electrons they have. So if we have a beryllium atom, a beryllium atom has two valence electrons. So to get a full valence shell, it would have to empty these two spots on this energy level, or they would have to fill the energy level by adding five more electrons I'm sorry, six more electrons to fill this spot. So one, two, three, four, five, six. It is easier to remove two electrons than it is to add six electrons. So therefore, they will empty these two spots, leaving the previous periods or principal energy level filled. And then, so beryllium will make a plus two charge. Similarly, if we go back to our friend nitrogen that we used as examples on the previous slide, nitrogen has five valence electrons, one, two, three, four, five. In order to get a full valence shell, it would have to either get rid of or lose these five valence electrons, or it would have to add three. So five is a smaller number of electrons to move than three. And so consequently, it will fill these three spots preferentially and form a nitrogen minus three ion. If we look at lithium, lithium has one valence electrons. It will form a plus one in order to simply remove this one valence electron. If we look at fluorine, fluorine is one away from having a full valence shell. So it is going to add one electron and that will make it a fluorine minus one ion. Group 18, has eight valence electrons, so it already has a full valence shell, so group 18 is unreactive. And they have a special name due to their lack of reactivity, and that is the noble gases. The elements that are, that are the most reactive or are only one electrons one electron away from either filling their valence shell or emptying their valence shell are generally the most reactive. And so those groups tend to have special names. Group one on the periodic table is the alkali metals. Group two is also a fairly reactive group. It's two electrons away from emptying its valence shell. And so these are the alkaline earth metals. The groups in the center of the periodic table are not quite as predictable. These have their special name, which is they are transition metals. They can do things like make multiple char positive charges. They do a lot of funky chemistry that is not nearly as predictable as some of the other chemistry that we see from other groups on the periodic table. Another highly reactive group on the periodic table are group 17. They're also one electron away and they are the halogens. And finally, we've already discussed the noble gases, which are very un- reactive. So this slide, I'm going to post three review questions. After the questions are posted, I would like you to t pause the video, take some time to think about the questions and answer them on your own, and then hit play and I'll discuss the answers and why the correct answers are correct. The first question is what is a column on the periodic table called? The second question is, what is the charge on an oxygen ion? The third question is, what is the name of group 18?
Pause your video now and answer the questions. So if we look at the question, what is a column on the periodic table? Columns are called groups and rows are called periods. If we determine what is the charge on an oxygen atom, we'll need a periodic table to answer this question. So if we look at our periodic table, oxygen is right here. It's represented by the symbol O. And oxygen is two spaces away, one, two, from having a full row. There's my oxygen atom. So that means that oxygen will make a negative two charge. And then for our final question, which is what is the name of group 18? That's the group that all the elements have a full valence shell and those are called noble gases because they are unreactive.